Let us pray. God of abundant grace, whose judgment is a part of your love for humankind, bring fire among us that we may be united in faithfulness rather than divided by competing interpretations of your word in our present times. Make us not so much predictors of the future as practicers of faithfulness in this present moment. Amen. Please let us listen for the word of God. The first reading comes from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Listen while I sing you this song, a song of my friend in his vineyard. My friend had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug the soil and cleared it of stones. He planted the finest vines. He built a tower to guard them, dug a pit for treading the grapes, and he waited for the grapes to ripen, but every grape was sour. So now, my friend says, you people who live in Jerusalem and Judah, judge between my vineyard and me. Is there anything I failed to do for it? Then why did it produce sour grapes and not the good grapes I expected? Well, here's what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge around it, break down the wall that protects it, and let wild animals eat it and trample it down. I will let it be overgrown with weeds. I will not trim the vines or hoe the ground. Instead, I will let briars and thorns cover it. I will even forbid the clouds to let rain fall on it. Israel is the vineyard of the Lord Almighty. The people of Judah are the vines he planted. He expected them to do what was good, but instead they committed murder. He expected them to do what was right, but their victims cried out for, peace, for justice. Here ends the reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The second reading is from the book of Psalms, Psalm 80, verses 1 through 2 and verses 8 through 19. It is a prayer for the nation's restoration. Listen to us, O shepherd of Israel. Hear us, leader of your flock. Seated on your throne above the winged creatures, reveal yourself to the tribes of Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Show us your strength. Come and save us. You brought, you brought a grapevine out of Egypt. You drove out other nations and planted it in their land. You cleared a place for it to grow. Its roots went deep and it spread out over the whole land. It covered the hills with its shade. Its branches overshadowed the giant cedars. It extended its branches to the Mediterranean Sea and as far as Euphrates River. Why did you break down the fences around it? Now anyone passing by can steal its grapes. Wild hogs trample it down and wild animals feed on it. Turn to us, almighty God. Look down from heaven at us. Come and save your people. Come and save this grapevine that you planted, this young vine you made grow so strong. Our enemies have set it on fire and cut it down. Look at them in anger and destroy them. Preserve and protect the people you have chosen, the nation you made so strong. We will never turn away from you again. Keep us alive and we will praise you. Bring us back, Lord God Almighty. Show us your mercy and we will be saved. Here ends the reading from the book of Psalms. May God bless our hearing and living of these words. Amen. God is still speaking. I've changed the scripture that I'm going to be reading this morning. It will be from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 29 through chapter 12, verse 3. And it comes from the message. By an act of faith, Israel walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. The Egyptians tried and drowned. By faith, the Israelites marched around the walls of Jericho for, for seven days, and the walls fell flat. By an act of faith, Rahab, the Jericho harlot, welcomed the spies and escaped the destruction that came on those who refused to trust God. I could go on and on, but I've run out of time. There are so many more, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets. 
Through acts of faith, they toppled kingdoms, made justice work, took the promises for themselves. They were protected from lions, fire, and sword thrusts, turned disadvantage to advantage, won battles, routed out alien armies. Women received their loved ones back from the dead. They were, there were those who, under torture, refused to give in and go free, preferring something better, resurrection. Others braved abuse and whips, and yes, chains, chains and dungeons. We have stories of those who were stoned, sawed in two, murdered in cold blood, stories of vagrants wearing, wandering the earth in animal skins, homeless, friendless, powerless. The world didn't deserve them, making their way their best as they could on the cruel edges of the world. Not one of these people, even though their lives of faith were exemplary, got their hands on what was promised. God had a better plan for us, that their faith and our faith would come together to make one completed whole, their lives of faith not complete apart from ours. Do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blazed the way, all these veterans, cheer, veterans cheering us on, it means we better get on with it. Strip down, start running, and never quit. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it. Because he never lost sight of where he was headed, that exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way. Cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor, right alongside God. When you find yourselves flagging in your faith, go over that story again, item by item, that long litany of hostility he plowed through. That will shoot adrenaline into your souls. Let us pray. In the speaking and hearing of these words, O oh God, may your word be found. Amen. Have you been watching the Rio Olympics like I have? Pretty amazing athletes, right? The swimming competition has been exciting to watch. Simone Manuel made, has made history as the first African-American woman to win swimming medals, and Maya Dorado has burst onto the scene. <coughs> then we have Michael Phelps and Katie Ledecky, who have literally blown everyone out of the water. Add Simone Biles' gymnastic feats, and we have that trinity of superstars. They seem to have some mysterious superpower that lift them above the rest. They have tapped into their God-given talents and, their, and taken their sports to entirely new levels. They are an inspiration to young athletes and children who have never even thought about the possibility of competition. And we all admire them for their accomplishments. In the letter to Hebrews, the writer encourages members of an early congregation that was experiencing hardship and persecution by holding up examples and inspiration of those ancestors in faith who endured much and accomplished marvelous things all through faith. It was not through their own superpowers, but through the power of God that they were able to do these amazing things, from crossing the Red Sea on dry land to shutting the mouths of lions and quenching raging fires. The cloud of witnesses included martyrs and military leaders, prophets and kings, women and men who trusted in God and persevered or were led through the worst that life can send their, our way. Do you feel a relationship with these pioneers of faith or are they just ancient history. 
I was born into a Christian family who took their faith very seriously and whose spiritual roots went back for generations. I was baptized as an infant and grew up in the church, attending church services, Sunday school, and Bible school at two churches during the summers. My mom was raised Lutheran by her parents, and my dad was raised Methodist by his. After marriage, they joined a small country church in Maryland, which was a joint Lutheran and Reformed congregation. My parents joined the Lutheran church, but we worshiped as a con one congregation on Sundays, alternating between the Lutheran and Reformed pastors, who both had three church charges. That is where my faith journey began. When my husband Larry and I moved back near my parents, we went to the same church, but we both felt more at home in the United Church of Christ congregation. I'm pretty sure that my decision to be ordained as a UCC pastor was based on my spiritual roots actually beginning with my baptism being done by the Reformed pastor, since we didn't have a Lutheran pastor at the time, and in spite of me being confirmed Lutheran. Well, that great cloud of witnesses includes not only the ancient Christians, but also my family and yours. I have been blessed to have some amazing seminary professors who are also part of that cloud. And although some of you may not have been raised in the Christian faith from childhood, you have come to it through your own faith journey, connecting with this great cloud of witnesses. During my seminary studies, I was amazed to find out that much of our current liturgy, our form of worship, dates back to manuscripts written in the tradition of the apostles by theologian Hippolytus in the third century. It really connected me to that great cloud of witnesses, all who went before us laying the groundwork for our worship. For example, the beginning of our communion prayer is basically the same as it was 1,800 years ago. It goes like this, and it'll sound familiar. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Up with your hearts. We have them with the Lord. Let us thank, give thanks to the Lord. It is fitting and right. In this small text, Hippolytus goes on to give instruction of early services of communion, baptism, catechism, ordination, and more. Other manuscripts were written in Latin, Arab, Arabic, Ethiopian, excuse me, and other languages dating from the year 500 to the 15th century. 2,000 years of Christianity have survived in its various forms by people who took their faith seriously, many of whom were willing to die for it, starting with Jesus himself, who was trying to reform Judaism. The apostles created churches when it was dangerous to do so. From the beginning, they struggled to teach the ways of Christ. Others along the way, like Martin Luther, sought to make reforms to the Catholic Church. And when that didn't work, he and other reformers formed the Protestant Church. Within Protestant churches, many different denominations were created when people disagreed over points of faith or ways of worship. Regardless of the differences, the bottom line is that faith in God has continued to guide us. Eugene Pat Peterson offers an interesting understanding of verse 40 in the message. God had a better plan for us, that their faith and our faith would come together to make one completed whole, their lives of faith not complete apart from ours. That suggests that our faith is also not complete apart from theirs. Imagine a race staggered over time that no one can finish until the last of the participants has entered. 
like a cosmic relay, to continue the Olympic analogy. And the race is still going on. And it is a race not for sport or entertainment, but one with uh, utmost importance. Walter Brueggemann describes a past, present, future view of the story of the faith community in which we share as a past of life-giving miracles, a future of circumstance-denying promise, and a present tense of neighbors in faith. This testimony matters. It matters to stay in this truth. It matters to practice this version of life. The story of amazing deeds from the past, the story of immovable resolve and faithful following of God's will inspires us today to be faithful where we are, to keep on keeping on, no matter what is happening around us, no matter how things appear. Things are still unfolding. There is still much more of the story to be told. How are we going to participate in the unfolding? Are we telling the story, giving testimony about what, what God is doing right here, right now? Are we connecting our own story to that of the saints who went before us, as well as those who will come after us? As we prepare to take our turn at running the race, we're told to lay aside heavy, every weight and the sin that clings so closely. And that's the, from the NRSV version. What sort of things might represent weights that we need to put aside? Are we carrying guilt, illusions, addictions, selfishness, greed? Are we carrying ambition and self-centeredness? Are we carrying heartaches and grudges that we could put down and in so doing lighten our load? Just laying aside what weighs us down in this race is not enough. We're instructed to keep our eyes on Jesus, who ran this same route before us and knows it well. Jesus set the pace and made it clear that he doesn't expect anything of us that he wasn't willing to undergo himself. While we don't emphasize our saints in the same way the Catholic Church does, we Protestants still have ours. We have our pilgrims, our abolitionists, our missionaries, our Antoinette Brown, the first woman ever ordained, our Lemuel Haynes, the first African-American person ordained by a mainline church, our Bill Johnson, the first openly gay person to be ordained. Of course, the price has been paid for the amazing deeds accomplished by faith, even by people in our own time. Martin Luther King Jr. and Nelson Mandela are only two examples of such heroes. Those without superpowers, but possessing a kind of marvelous faith that sustained them in the worst of circumstances. It was as if they could see something with their hearts that their eyes could not yet perceive. In the meantime, we live our lives in the church with our other aspiring saints, sisters and brothers who share these ancestors and these hopes. Walter Brueggemann speaks of the saints of the past as being those through whom the light has shone, that is, who are kind and generous toward others and who respect people not like us, those who stay present in love and mercy where there is dying and illness and violence. Like many others, Brueggemann describes faith as trust in a God who has made promises that are true. While the text takes the long view of things, we too, in our day, are part of the story, and our struggle and our deeds matter as well. 
He also speaks of the intergenerational mystery of the church. How their lives count depends on our lives. How well they did is determined by how well we do. And it matters to us that those who follow us will have examples of faith to fortify them as they too run the course. Not only because we tell them these stories about people long ago, but because we will have added our own stories as well. Our faith is not apart from the faith of our great-great-grandchildren. We're part of something greater than ourselves, a bigger picture, a more timeless story. What makes the stories of the saints in Hebrews so powerful is remembering that these folks were not superhuman. They were human beings, flawed, weak, and sinful, all the things that we are. Even Moses was not permitted to, by God to enter the promised land because he had broken faith with God. And these other great heroes, they are known not only for great deeds, but for other things as well. Samson and Delilah, David and Bathsheba. So, if these grand, great ancestors of ours could be deeply flawed, flawed, yet deeply faithful, I find that very, very encouraging when I have to run such a long, long race. Are we willing to take up the fight for issues that are before us in the world today, in this country, based on the examples Christ has given us for how to treat others? Do we care for the poor, the homeless, the hungry, the imprisoned? Do we respect those who may appear to be different from ourselves? People of color, immigrants, the LGBT community. Do we respect those who believe differently from us? Muslim, Jews, Hindu, Buddhist, those of any faith and those of no faith. What we do matters. What we say matters. And we need to hold each other accountable. We imagine that as we warm up, train, get suited up, as we run the race, lap after lap, mile after mile toward that ultimate goal, goal that far better country that we long for, we can picture that we're not alone in this effort. No, we don't run this race in vain, and we don't run it alone. According to our text, we can take courage, find strength, seek inspiration, let our spirits be lifted by the assurance that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who are watching us and who are wholeheartedly cheering us on. You know that they know where the power comes from. As we hunger and thirst in this day for the coming of God's reign, for God's shalom, for peace and healing in the world, in places close to us like our homes and families and neighborhoods, and in places far away like the Sudan and Iraq, Afghanistan and Syria, in France and Turkey and Germany, we know that the race we run is long and hard that wholeness is so often a faraway place. So much of the time, peace and justice are things unseen, and yet faith, according to the author of the same letter, is the faith, faith is the assurance of things unseen. We may stumble, we may even fall on our way, just like those heroes and saints long ago, but we know we are not alone that our eyes are fixed on Jesus. And if we listen closely, we can hear and feel the encouragement of those who have gone before. Those are, who are still watching the race that is not yet over. In an interview of a member of the United States Olympic women's gymnastic team, he was asked, is it hard to be a team when you're also competing against one another? The young woman never hesitated. 
When I'm up there competing, she responded, all I hear is my teammates cheering me on and it makes me do my best. Let us run this race together and cheer each other on. Amen.